Welcome to stop number 24 on our journey through the Word. Today we're going to be focusing on 1 Kings chapter 6. Make sure you've got a Bible handy, open it up to 1 Kings chapter 6, and make sure you've got a pen and some paper so that you can take some notes the, today as well. Throughout the entire course of the month of June, we are going to be asking ourselves about the principles that we use to make decisions. The principles of right and wrong and what's wise or foolish. And all of those things come from God's established order. Throughout the course of this study, we have seen a biblical pattern time and time again that has played out. God establishes an order. Humanity violates that order, and we call that sin. God then has to pronounce a judgment, some consequences for that sin. But at the same time, God is gracious and does not allow humanity to experience the full weight of their sin. Now, in a Christian's life, we strive to live in accordance with God's order. We, we develop a habit of submitting our decisions to God. Today, we're going to look at one specific kind of decision, and that decision has to do with the methods that we use in worship. Now, what I'd like you to do right now is, on your piece of paper, I want you to write just two words. The first word is cathedral. The second word is tarp. And we're going to get to those here in just a second. I have been privileged in my life to be able to worship in a wide variety of places. When I was in college, I had the opportunity to worship in St. Paul's Cathedral in London, England, and it is a gorgeous building. The space in there is just stunning, and this picture does it no justice whatsoever. It only gives you a hint of the idea. You get into that space, and it is imposing, and you just, you, you are in awe of the space. The light and the color, the way that they bounce around the room, it there's only one word for it, and it's wow. You can hear the smallest sounds even as people are milling about in, in looking at this beautiful structure. And there are people who are drawn from around the world every year to look at St. Paul's Cathedral. I've also had the opportunity to worship in this little structure made of little wooden poles and tarps. Yes, you heard me right. That, that church building is made of tarps. As guests, we got the prime seating, which in most of America we would consider to be plastic lawn chairs. The members of the church, they sat on rugs on the ground. They have one piece of furniture in the church building that is a small communion table. And we got a very passionate tour of this small little church building when I visited there. Now, what I want you to do on your paper, don't do this out loud. I just want you to write down the answers to a couple of questions. First, which of the two church buildings do you like better, the cathedral or the tarp church building? And which building do you think is better for worship, the cathedral or the tarp building. Now, don't share your answers with anybody, but we will come back to those answers in just a few minutes. My next question for you to consider is, what do you need to feel like you are in worship? Does the physical environment influence that? Do you need great soaring architecture? Do you need specific kinds of, of shapes or colors or light? Maybe it's the seating. Maybe it's the furniture that you need. Are, is there a particular kind of sound that you need? Is there uh, a soaring organ, or is it just the, the harmony of human voices? Maybe there's a certain kind of clothing, either for you or for someone else, that, that needs to be worn so that you can feel like you've been worshiping. I want you to realize that all of those things are methods. 
Last week, during our Bible reading, we read the account of Solomon completing his father David's dream of building a temple for God's glory. I want to real recognize right off the bat that a temple is a method. We're going to read pieces of 1 Kings chapter 6. 1 Kings chapter 6, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4 and then 15 through 38. So read along with me. It was in mid-spring in the month of Ziv, during the fourth year of Solomon's reign, that he began to construct the temple of the Lord. This was 480 years after the people of Israel were rescued from their slavery in the land of Egypt. The temple of, that King Solomon built for the Lord was 90 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 45 feet high. The entry room at the front of the temple was 30 feet wide, running across the entire width of the temple. It projected outward 15 feet from the front of the temple. Solomon also made narrow recessed windows throughout the temple. The entire inside from floor to ceiling was paneled with wood. He paneled the walls and ceilings with cedar. He used planks of cypress for the floors. He partitioned off an inner sanctuary, the most holy place at the far end of the temple. It was 30 feet deep and was paneled with cedar from floor to ceiling. The main room of the temple outside the most holy place was 60 feet long. Cedar paneling completely covered the stone walls throughout the temple, and the paneling was decorated with carvings of gourds and open flowers. He prepared the inner sanctuary at the far end of the temple where the Ark of the Lord's Covenant would be placed. This inner sanctuary was 30 feet long, 30 feet wide, and 30 feet high. He overlaid the inside with solid gold. He also overlaid the altar made of cedar. Then Solomon overlaid the rest of the temple's interior with solid gold. He made gold chains to protect the entrance to the most holy place. He, so he finished overlaying the entire temple with gold, including the altar that belonged to the most holy place. He made two cherubim of wild olive wood, each 15 feet tall, and placed them in the inner sanctuary. The wingspan of each of the cherubim was 15 feet, each wing being seven and a half feet long. The two cherubim were identical in shape and size, each was 15 feet tall. He placed them side by side in the inner sanctuary of the temple. Their outspread wings reached from wall to wall while their inner wings touched at the center of the room. He overlaid the two cherubim with gold. He decorated all the walls of the inner sanctuary and the main room with carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. He overlaid the floor in the rooms with gold. For the entrance to the inner sanctuary, he made double doors of wild olive wood with five-sided doorposts. These double doors were decorated with carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. The doors, including the decorations of cherubim and palm trees, were overlaid with gold. Then he made four-sided doorposts of wild olive wood for the entrance to the temple. There were two folding doors of cypress wood, and each door was hinged to fold back upon itself. These doors were decorated with carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers, all overlaid evenly with gold. The walls of the inner courtyard were built so that there was one layer of cedar beams between every three layers of finished stone. The foundation of the Lord's temple was laid in the mid-spring in the month of Ziv during the fourth year of Solomon's reign. The entire building was completed in every detail by mid-autumn in the month of Bull during the eleventh year of his reign. So it took seven years to build the temple. Now, several weeks ago, we read First Chronicles and there we saw that David had made plans to build a temple to honor God. But God denied David that building permit. He even confronted David and he asked him, Have I ever asked for this? No, no I haven't. For nearly 500 years, God had resided among the people of Israel in a tent the tabernacle that Moses and the people of Israel had built after they had left Egypt. And then comes Solomon, and he builds David's vision of this awesome temple. The, the description we have 
for it here has been turned into some some artwork by various artists to help us get some idea of what this would look like. History tells us that Solomon completed this building project approximately 959 years before Christ. During the seven-year period, not a single iron tool was heard in the temple area because they wanted to honor God. The entire effort of craftsmanship and silence was so that God would be honored. And even though God had never requested nor commanded the building of a temple, when it was finished, he still blessed the temple with his presence. We read about that in 1 Kings 9. For nearly 400 years, this temple is the place of worship for the nation of Israel. Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian emperor, destroys this temple in the year 586 B.C., and all of its furnishings are carried off to Babylon. After 70 years of captivity, the, the people of Israel are allowed to return to Jerusalem. They have several leaders, including Zerubbabel and Ezra and Nehemiah. And it is under Ezra's leadership that they complete the building of the second temple in approximately 516 B.C., the people of Israel celebrated the completion of this new temple, but at the same time, there were some people in Israel that, that mourned. The celebration was for the restoration of worship according to God's commands. But the mourning, the grieving, was because this second temple, for as great as it was, still was not as glorious as the first temple. They, they felt like they were not glorifying and honor God, honoring God to the best of their ability. Hundreds of years pass, and along comes a new ruler by the name of Herod. We refer to him as Herod the Great. And he started refurbishing this second temple in 19 BC. And so grand were his plans that they lasted until well after his death. And this restoration of the second temple wasn't complete until 63 AD. And so the second temple, under restoration, is the temple that Jesus and his apostles knew. The disciples were so impressed one day when they were visiting this temple that they turned to Jesus and they said, Look at these great stones! Isn't this structure impressive? Jesus' response is telling because he looks at them and he says, It won't last, guys. Now, I realize that, yes, there are times in the New Testament that we read of Jesus being very irritated by the methods of worship because they weren't honoring God. Instead, he, he got very angry and he confronted sin because there in the temple, the way that people were choosing to worship God actually violated God's order of right and wrong. They were sinning with the way that they were choosing to behave in the temple grounds. One day as he traveled, Jesus came through Samaria and he, he met a Samaritan woman. And she had a conversation with Jesus about the location of worship. We read about it in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4, verse 21, Jesus looks at the woman and he says, Believe me, dear woman, the time is coming when it will no longer matter whether you worship the Father on this mountain or in Jerusalem. And my paraphrase of that is Jesus looks at her and says, It's not about geography. Worship is not about a specific location. Now, Jesus was crucified approximately 33 AD, and the temple reconstruction or renovation was still going on. It lasts for another 30 years, and it's finally completed. And then in 70 AD, the Romans come through and they destroy the second temple, just seven years after its restoration had been completed. Several hundred years go by, and there are attempts at rebuilding the temple. Since the year 692, there have been other structures that have been on, built on the site of the temple. 
The current structure, the Dome of the Rock, has been sitting there since 1023, almost a thousand years, that that structure has been set on the site of the Jewish temple. Now, there are today Jewish organizations that are striving to rebuild the temple to God on that same site. Currently, there are two organizations that are working towards that. One has already been raising money and building the furniture and developing all of the ritual items that they need in order to carry out worship according to the Old Testament. And why would they be doing such a thing? Because it is their desire to restore worship according to God's Old Testament commands. They are seeking to restore that relationship between God and humanity. But they have confused method, the temple, with relationship. In many cases, uh, Christians are guilty of doing that as well. I learned a lot during the worship wars of the 1990s. What I heard most was arguing about specific methods of worship. And it came down to whether or not people liked or disliked those specific methods. What I rarely heard during those years were questions like, are these methods right or wrong according to God's revealed standards in Scripture? Are these methods wise or are they foolish according to God's wisdom in Scripture? And honestly, I still don't hear those questions very often. Now, I want you to think back to our cathedral and our tarp church buildings that we began this message with. Which building did you like better? Which building was better for worship, do you think? Now, I, I realize that that's a trick question. Are your answers the same? Did you say that the building that you liked better is also the one that's better for worship? You see, we often confuse methods and relationship. The struggle there is that God has always wanted a personal relationship with humanity. I want you to think back to when we began our journey through the Word in the book of Genesis. In, in Genesis chapter 2, it tells us that God walked with Adam and Eve. He wanted a personal relationship with them. In the New Testament, in the book of Acts, we are told that when we are baptized into Christ, we are given the gift of the Holy Spirit. That means that the Holy Spirit is living in us. Now, the really cool thing is, that wasn't something God had just dreamed up right then. Nearly 587 years earlier, the prophet Ezekiel had said that God wanted to be with us. He had promised that his spirit would come on humanity over 600 years before the book of Acts happened. And then the Apostle Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 that you are God's temple. I want you to think about the, the structures that we have seen pictures of right now. As awe-inspiring as Solomon's temple was, as incredible as St. Paul's Cathedral is, God walking with me through my day is infinitely more awesome. Not because I'm anything to look at, but because God chooses to be with me. He has chosen time and time again to be in a close relationship with humanity. His heart's desire is to walk with us through this life. Rather than staying in the most opulent of homes and waiting for us to be to arrive and then to be in awe of his house, he wants to live with you and me. And that should stop us in our tracks. God prefers 
your presence more than any method that humanity can dream up. Whether it's an incredible temple that is covered in gold, whether it's the soaring dome of St. Paul's Cathedral, or a tiny little church building made of tarps, God still prefers your presence more. So your homework for this week is a slight adaptation of the homework that from last week and, and a slight adaptation of our homework for this entire month. When you face decisions about worship, about the methods that will be used in worship, ask yourself these two questions. Is this right or wrong according to God's order? Is it wise or foolish according to God's wisdom? We need to consider the methods of our worship. Why? Because oftentimes we are guilty of replacing God's order with our preferences. And so our methods of worship need to be examined in terms of right and wrong, wise and foolish, according to God's order. And when we submit our methods of worship to God's order, that's when God is really honored. Because what we're doing is we are putting him first. And that's just as it should be. So this week... Submit your worship to God. Submit your methods of worship to His order. And let's glorify Him together.